everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for this evening's Wheaton Conversation with artists Kate Rhodes and Jen Ellick. Thank you for joining us and um, to, to everyone and Pamela Wakeman. I have um, just a few things to go over before we start this great program. We wanted to uh, highlight the fact that we have uh, wonderful program sponsors, PNC Arts Alive and Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass. Uh, we thank them for the support of this program and, and many others. Um, we also invite you to support Wheaton Arts, and you can do that through membership, donations, and shopping, always my favorite, at shopwheatonarts.org. And I'll, again, put those links in the chat for you. You'll also see in the chat a link to the next upcoming Wheaton Conversation with Dan Bailey and Richard Royal on Thursday, January 27th, and that, again, is at 6 p.m. Um, my name is Marcy Peterson. I'm a white woman in my mid-50s. Uh, this evening I have a gray top on and I might use the pronouns she, her, hers. And I recognize that I am, well, I'm broadcasting to you from Southern New Jersey. And I recognize this land, this land as originally those of the Lenai Lenape. Um, I am handing the program over to Pamela Wakeman at this time, my co-worker for quite a long time. And it's all yours now, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. And hi, everybody. It is my pleasure to join you once again. Um, I am Pamela Wakeman, as Marcy mentioned. I'm the Director of Education and Artist Services at Wheaton Arts, for those who do not know me. I'm a white female in my mid-30s with long brown hair and blue eyes. Tonight I'm wearing a gray sweater. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I recognize that I'm also broadcasting um, from the traditional lands of the Lenai Lenape. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest. Our first guest is Kate Rhodes. Kate Rhodes uses traditional Italian techniques as a base to create sculptures, vessels, jewelry, and public art. The aquatic realm is the root of much of her work, the result of spending six years on a boat in the Caribbean in her youth. She lived surrounded by nature, the liquid light and aquatic life imprinted upon her senses. The sculptures she creates emanate from her early experiences with and curiosity about the natural world. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Our second guest is Jen Ellick. Jen is a studio artist and educator based in Seattle, Washington. Ellick investigates interpersonal themes and the notion of community by creating objects and installations of colorful glass and neon light employed as nonverbal form of communication. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. Definitely, thank you so very much. Uh, welcome everyone to the talk. I first uh, would like to start by uh, saying that Jen and I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle the Duwamish people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Um, Jen and I actually live pretty close to each other in Seattle, so I'm getting us both in there. And uh, Pam, thank you so much for introducing me and Marcy, thanks so much for getting things going. Uh, yes, I grew up in the Bahamas and Virgin Islands. So this is my father's last sailboat. And um, I spent a lot of time underwater. My mom ran a dive business when I was uh, preteen age, age. So uh, that was pretty fantastic. And I moved a number of places around the country, but then I ended up in the Pacific Northwest. And it's fascinating here in the Pacific Northwest. They don't have the same type of things underwater. And I've been slowly learning about especially the megaflora, the aquatic megaflora, which is my favorite. These are bull kelp and they are local seaweed. Um, I uh, just wanna say thank you so much to uh, Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center. I first started going there, I think in 1991 within my first two years of glass experience and being able to go to a facility 
where you're encouraged to just experiment and try new things and you're not financially responsible for that has been invaluable to me. So um, you're seeing some work that I made there in 2006. Uh, I no, nope, yes, 2006, I did have my first residency in 1996. And yeah, and then 2007, I went back. I also uh, went for Glass Lovers Weekend and had my first taste of working in front of big crowds uh, with Alino and Shahuli for the Venetian experience there. So I, I kind of grown up with Wheaton, coming back periodically, knowing the people who work there and uh, spending time with them. It's been very excellent. Uh, so the beehive that you see, this is pre Hex Marini, so it is actually just pieces of fluorescent tubing. The comb brick, which I love so much, that sort of shows my passion for Italian patterning and layering and um, my influence from painters like Van Gogh. I really love um, glass blowing and being in the hot shop, but also doing sculpture is one of my passions. So this piece was made courtesy of uh, Wheaton Arts as well. I had a donation from a nearby factory of seven millimeter fluorescent tubing, which uh, I sprayed with enamel, slumped and fired in the kilns at Wheaton and then brought home to uh, put together. Uh, I really love dwellings. I think from living on a boat, I was very fascinated with a uh, home. So you can see the scale of this piece by looking at my figure, myself, I'm inside of it there. Uh, again, I love Italian patterning. I've spent some time uh, in Murano on a Fulbright, and I spent a lot of time in Seattle working with people who were excellent glass blowers and and following that path. And you know that's where I ran into Jen when I first moved to town. But here you can see sort of one of my fantasy seaweeds where I weave together these uh, hollow marini. That's what I call them into uh, forms. So Arabesque uh, lives in Florida right now, but um, I really like uh, constructing things in an organic fashion. And then there's Jen. Jennifer, I invite you in for an introduction. I've known Jen for, I don't wanna say how long, but uh, we met each other first time at Pilchuck. And that was very uh, exciting dynamic time in the 90s for me, Pilchuck, and it was just fantastic. And then we moved here around to the Pacific Northwest around the same time and poof, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Kate and Wheaton for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, my name's Jen Ellick, my pronouns are she, her, and thank you again, Kate, for acknowledging us occupying Duwamish land. Um, I was so excited um, to be invited to be part of this conversation. Um, Kate's an artist who I've admired for a long time, so I'm looking forward to this. I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's a town that's uh, heavily industrial, uh, the home of the Bethlehem Steel and part of the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Bethlehem's really unique in that it um, also is a very natural area being right by the Pocono Mountains. So I lived um, somewhere between this heavily industry and natural areas. And I think a lot of my work um, tries to find a balance between those two worlds that we live in. And this is my grandfather, William Ellick, and it's a third generation uh, plumbing business that, that my family was a part of. My great grandfather started it in 1912. I'm so grateful for my family and it, it being an intact unit and showing me the importance of family and community from an early age. I studied undergraduate at Alfred University um, earning a BFA, uh, graduating in 1994. I know that's something that Kate and I share, that we're both Alfred alumni. The program there was very experimental when I went there. They really enjoy students um, having that naivete with the material, and you don't get a lot of technical instruction. Um, and I really appreciate that time to, to approach the material 
um, in such a pure way. But when I left Alfred and moved out to Seattle in the Northwest in 95, I was really hungry for that, um, that technical information on how to do it. And um, I think that's one of the things that really excited me about Kate's work is that she was really technically proficient, but also had um, a really solid foundation and conceptual thought and ideas. I'm really lucky to have had such a great support system after I moved out to Seattle. A lot of women in the community um, gave me opportunities. Um, I didn't know a lot of people. And I met Kate first at um, Pilchuck Glass School. She was a teacher's assistant for Michael Shiner's class I took. And um, seeing her slideshow just made me realize, wow, you can, you can do both. You can get the technical skill and learn from tradition, but also make it your own by being a conceptual artist. These days, I am an object maker, but I also like to make landscapes that are sort of including the viewer and invite participation. And I do a lot of this work collaboratively with my husband, Jeremy Burt, who's a neon artist, sign electrician. Um, we just finished teaching a concentration class at Penland School of Crafts this past fall, where we focused on glass and its relationship with light. And a lot of the teaching I do is involved in that theme. And those are some photos of examples of uh, light and movement where we did long exposure photography um, exercises with the class. And I love that exercise because we really get different results with each group of people. Is, is this Jeremy in the photo with you? This is actually Jeremy and I, and we're just messing around getting ready and we have a long string of LED lights and we played around with putting those lights on different sticks or mechanisms and movements and Penland's a weaving school. I don't think I added that slide. And we actually were trying to figure out how to make it look like the light is woven. And we did get a great shot of that. And that's a student up on a big ladder. And we were twirling this um, string of LEDs around to try to get this sort of formation. It almost looks architectural. Well, I'll just interject in here to say that um... We both studied under Fred Cheetah and Alfred at Alfred, and he's sort of a phenomena in himself. And uh, he really uh, makes me think of Jackie too, like just light phenomena. Mm. Those guys just loved it so much. And it's- uh, Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned Fred. That tradition, like, you know, you and Jeremy really, to me, speak a lot of like the way he used to be when he was younger and uh, how experimental he was and working with Deborah Donay with pieces mm. and collaborating um, in the past, of course, yeah. But, um, Definitely, Fred continues to inspire uh, light and as, motion, you know, and he's point. a great object maker as well, but the concept of light and motion is still something really exciting and people are just really starting to dig into again. Well, I'll start you Ooh, on your inspiration. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I like this section. Uh, Kate and I were discussing, what should we talk about? And we're both really excited about talking about our inspirations. And I know Kate's also super inspired by the natural world, but I'm a little bit more of a land lover. I didn't really grow around by the coast. I didn't grow up by the coast. So um, I grew up in inland Pennsylvania and uh, I spend a, as much time as possible when I'm not in the studio in our natural world. And um, coming from the East Coast, I remember fall being sort of a challenging time. It's not as colorful um, out West. We have um, a lot more conifers than deciduous trees. And then when I started, I, I started to experience it and walk around in the fall, I realized it is a whole different world out here. Um, the mycological, um, flora and fauna it's just a totally different world and it just really opened up to me once I was willing to be quiet and really pay attention to what it was around me I realized the huge harvest and I had friends like Joe Benvenuto who um, introduced me to this world and I'm so grateful to have this time out in the woods um, being quiet and really looking mushrooms hunting is really sort of fun in that way um, you'll drive for hours and hours to these super remote areas, have these grueling hikes to high elevation and sort of stand and just be quiet and look until you start seeing them. And I just love that activity so much. It gives me a lot of joy. That one on the left is uh, some Porcini, Porcini twins um, and one of the most amazing specimens I've ever found being conjoined like that. 
What what are these mushrooms? Can, that's a bear tooth hydamin. It's like a coral a mushroom. Um, and that was a fun also visit. Um, I also go with Dave Walters. That trip was Dave Walters and Joe Benvenuto out in the woods. And we were standing there and we're like, we didn't really find anything at this spot. And I said, hey, Joe, look over your head. And this giant mushroom was in a tree above his head. And we quickly got a knife on a stick and used our shoelaces to cut it down and our sweatshirts to catch it, just like a, a fireman catching somebody jumping out of a fire. It was really fun to um, experience that with your friends and, um, and just see how special our natural world is in the Pacific Northwest. I think that um, picture on the right was from a trip that you and I did with some of our girlfriends up to Mount Baker. So we're looking at Mount Baker there. So such a beautiful time. It was such a mm. clear, gorgeous day. And um, I'm not a big snow person. So it was fantastic to go to the mountains. I just want to I want to share with both you of you that Fred Tashida is joining us and uh, he's oh, asking great. <laughs> and he's asking Jen um, he said did you did you bring your dogs to Penlin? <laughs> I wish um, we lost Scout so it's just Sweetie now and uh, Sweetie did stay here but she had a really great auntie Lou Cania watching her and I think she had a lot of fun without us. <laughs> I kept seeing Sweetie on Instagram everywhere. So she really made the rounds with a lot of friends. So thanks Lou for taking such good care of her. It really helps put your mind at ease when you know your loved ones are cared for when you're away for so long. Um, and you can see in this picture, this is part of our newest series that I'm collaborating with my husband, Jeremy Burt. I have a neon studio here at home that I share with Jeremy. Um, I do the design work and sort of the post-production work. Jeremy's the glass vendor and I'll do um, the framework and laying out the patterns and creating the patterns, but Jeremy solely bends all this work. And during the COVID shutdown, we sort of pivoted and knew that I wouldn't be able to make as much blown glass in the studio. So we said, hey, let's use our home studio to make this next body of work for the upcoming Tra Traver show in March. And um, I took a lot of inspiration from guidebooks, from the golden guidebooks, especially the mid-century guidebooks and, um, and that I use a lot when I'm out mushroom hunting and realized how much information you can get from these illustrated books beyond the photographic books, the color choices. And um, we're really excited about using neon as a mechanism to highlight how beautiful our natural world is um, to harness that commercial advertising towards a very different means. What, what are these birds? Uh, we're looking at a flicker, a northern flicker on the left and a downy woodpecker, both visitors to, um, I became sort of an amateur birder during COVID hanging up uh, bird feeders right by my workspace so I could see. And um, there's only a limited palette available in neon. So we had to get into finding ways to represent um, some of the details. And I've started airbrushing on the neon with sign paint. Ooh, now it's my turn. All right. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with uh, my biggest inspiration. Um, and it's not like I was inspired as a child, but I think because just the way my brain works, like coral is just fascinating to me because um, stuff underneath the water, it's not always exactly a plant or an animal or a mineral, but it can be a big combination. So you'll see algae and coral living together and then a lot of little multiple things that of course makes me happy and it sort of dovetails into this image that I have of me on the B team back in, I think it was 91. Um, wow. I just, my, my brain, it just really likes mathematics and not like, cause I'm dyslexic. So I'm not really good at real mathematics, but just using all these little pieces kind of, it just really clicked for me. And I, and I like that. And you'd have to think that the first time I saw Dick Marquis make his Roman bowl where he stuck stuff together and then slumped it over things like it just made my head explode when I was a kid. And um, so what, made, a what lot do you of, think made the jump from um, doing like connected Marini work to then weaving it together? Oh, that seems that like a was, really important jump for you. Well, that was Harumi. That was she inspired me like with her work. and. Mm. you're going to see in a minute it's like it kind of makes sense down the road like I used to weave a lot of stuff together as a kid and uh but mm. 
a spending time around these Italians and people who have taken this sort of Italian technique of Marini and cane making, it just really clicked in my head for some reason. I think it's because I'm supposed to be a fabric pattern designer or something like that. But so these are two uh, historical pieces on the right, it's Ercole Barovier and on the left, it's a, it's a Toso, it's a Toso piece, I believe. That's just amazing, like the, the way the color stretches and the striations and the, there's just something really about how the, the Italians, they just knew so much. I mean, and also they would use their knowledge with like making chandeliers to like make 10 foot tall pieces that look like underwater sea coral or algae. This is, um, this is- uh, Martinucci? Yeah, Martinucci, and Napoleon Martinucci. So on the <laughs> right side, there's too. like <laughs> the little piece, little, he used to like make these small decorative plant pieces that are so cool. But really, what I really love is these large scale pieces he did. And this is like 1930 in Rome. And it's like, of course, they did it very much like how they did their chandeliers. It's so much fun. And that sort of dovetails into, um, I have this wow. thing for natural history museums. I think it's a lot about, uh, since I lived in nature as a child, it's that presentation to nature, to people who are in urban spaces to like, get them to see how your animal or plant was in the natural world. I'm just always amazed by plants and animals. And I'm also really intensely curious about organic architecture. And I think um, Buckminster Fuller really, uh, he was more of an organic engineer before he became an architect. And so his work really reflects that. So that sort of hexagonal construction really speaks to me because I don't like hard angles so much as I like soft things. And then that sort of dovetails into, like for seven years I volunteered at the Seattle Aquarium and <clears throat> my mom tells me when, when we grew up on the boat that we would take a bucket and dump it in the water when we were passing through the Sargasso Sea from the Bahamas to the, to the sorry, from the Keys, Florida Keys to the Bahamas, there's this Sargasso Sea. Um, and so we would catch the Sargasso and we would just catch water. We would pour it through um, pillowcases and look at all the diatoms and look at everything that was left there. So I started at the aquarium, I started look, using a microscope and looking at plants and animals and baby plants and animals. And um, I love diatoms, they're silica structures, so glass structures and just so fascinating. And then I also got to study more um, the plants, uh, the seaweed and, and the animals from this area. So that's a winged kelp uh, or a laria uh, on the right, which is really long piece of like, sea bacon. So if you look mm. at, if you look at, uh, it's like, you know, you can see somebody's illustration where it's all perfect, but then when you go into the wild, it's never going to look like that. Right. So, and, and if you're diving, then you try to represent it somehow, but I just love all the different um, ways that the, the seaweed wow. can move and look like the ruffles. And I used to uh, be a costume designer in a, in a previous life in college. So that kind of tension, like I'm very curious, not about representing nature perfectly sometimes, but more being inspired by different parts of it and to take those for myself and then create something new that's like a hybrid to a certain extent. Keep before- I have a question for you. Yes, Jen. Um, like as you started this weaving process, you know, you're looking at Buckminster Fuller kind of thing and like this math. It's, and did you decide like that you were gonna be strict with it or that it was okay to, if it took like an organic path? Because it has such a beautiful structure. There is sort of like an organic math in there, but you're able to balance both like the math, the structure, but having it be organic. Did you make a, a decision in the beginning when you got started which way it was going to go, or if you were just going to embrace it as it goes. For this piece specifically, or just in... or Sure, or just in general, like when you started doing this um, process. With this were you type going of work? for one thing specifically, or were you just open to what would come from it? I just, I started by um, weaving a bunch of different houses together, not even using hexagons mm. or anything. 
and it's just sort of that lashing <clears throat> and weaving that, you know, on the boat, my job was to do decorative knot tying so that, mm. uh, but it was more useful. Like if you have a railing that's going to slip, you tie a rope around it so you can hold on to it. Or uh, I used to make baggy wrinkle for the boat. If there's any fiber kind of stuff, they'd let me do it because it was something my, my parents had macrame taught to me when I was young because of my hyperactivity in hopes to focus me in on something, which was a good thing because that, that worked for sure. But a um, great skill. But, you know, I think I get locked into a way of working now and I want to stay true to it, but uh, I'm trying to work on smaller experiments so I can get back to being more organic with things. But I think this is structural, so you? I have a system. This one's over 300 hours, but it's five wow. feet, it's five feet across basically, which is, but that's just the weaving that doesn't count for making the glass or anything, but. Uh, that's incredible, yeah. Kate. Oh, so kind. Um, Pam, did, what was your question? Yeah, so we have a question from Michelle Plakinski. Uh, they want Hi, to Michelle. know, <laughs> they want to know. Alfred. You, oh, yay. More, <laughs> if you could go back in time and work with any master glass craftsman from another Ooh. era, who would it be and why? Ooh. My God, there's like 10 of them in my head already. I know. I know. Um, like Alfredo Barbini or... Oh, I really like uh, this guy who was um, a Zakin, actually. Zakin, he's a designer, a glass designer. They all have to be architects in, in Italy. Uh, oh, they're Scarpa. Scarpa, Zakin, mm, mm, mm. um, uh, Alfredo Barbini. Uh, I, I don't know, glass people. I got like, one. There's, what's yours, Jen? Well, I did have the opportunity to work with him early on a few times, but I just want another chance is Pino. I know he was really inspirational to you, Kate. Um, he was there at Pilchek, our first session together. And I was in Michael Shiner's class, but I have to say, I spent a lot of time around Pino's class watching him. And like I, I said, he's somebody, did. we all did. He, he, he was extraordinary. He was extraordinary and he gave so much and he recognized passion in other people who are as passionate about the glass. And I think he recognized that in you and me early on. And um, you. Yeah. I didn't really know a lot of people when I got to Pilchek. And he was so kind to me when I got there because I think he did recognize, I, I really did have that passion. I did want to learn. And um, to just be able to um, either watch Pino or work with him again, I think that would have to be my choice. But I agree, there's like a good 10, you know, that I'm inspired by, but. Being able to go back in time, I would get a couple more moments with Pino. Yeah, I, I, I would want more time with Pino from that time, mm, specifically, because yeah. <laughs> well, you can help him. He was so charismatic, <laughs> you know. Like, uh, things changed a little bit over time for me with him, but I, I, I think when I was so young and had such stars in my eyes. It all was so magic. Everything was magic. And he <laughs> loved being the magician. Like it was incredible. Absolutely. Nobody else, Jen? Thanks, Michelle. I would say Martinucci. Yeah. Oh, Martinucci. I love his work so much. What did you like about his work so much? Oh, I liked his color choices, um, his simple styling, um, working with animals you know, animal fig figuratively, but so simple. And it, it was like sort of quick work. It didn't look over labored. So I, I like that. I like that furnace culture of quick did gestural work from the furnace, but it did have okay. enough details and it was stylized. It was, it was beautifully stylized. In a All way, like right now, I'm super inspired by Charlie Harper, a mid-century graphic designer who would look at animals and sort of break them down into their small, their most simplest line work, which is inspiring for me right now as I'm trying to do this work in neon and how can I represent it well, but also pare it down to its most simplest forms. That's so beautiful. Um, I think I have to throw in Ercole Barovier as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, he was definitely, and, and I got to work with his descendant. <laughs> Uh, Rosa Baravier, Mentasti, uh, while I was in Italy, that was really a great experience. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm going to cruise on. Hey, who designed the leaf plate? 
Uh, you know, I should mention that. That's like one of my all-time favorite glasses. Tapia Verkula? Was that? Tapia Verkula. It was a Tira was Lundgren. Tapia. No, Tira Lundgren. Sorry, That's another right, Scandinavian. Tira yeah. Yeah. The piece that launched a thousand pieces. I'm still I incredibly was... inspired by that. But I would say Tapia Verkula is right up there too with me and, and inspirations. Well, did Keiko ever get to work with Martin Nutzi or is that just time-wise so wrong, right? Because the 40s. Sure. No, he spent 40 years at, at Vanini um, as their so Those guest animals, host. those Vanini animals, like, I can't even tell you. Oh, yeah, you guys know. I make the two wow. moves. Uh, uh, wow. Sometimes I cast them in, in plaster, then cut them. Um, we've been doing bigger tubes lately. You can see here's my kiln. We're going to have a little cut experience and then contrasted with that's a fire polished experience so i fire polish my units so they become conical and i weave them together and i can use their orientation to affect the way the curvature moves in the piece so a lot of times i am constrained by the metal thing that supports it Ooh, and i love working with people and like this is from my 50th birthday where just I have um, Pat Davidson, there's Pat Davidson and the pink there. You know, I love working within my community. It just makes me so, so happy to do that. Um, part of my process is trying out new things and doing stuff. So here on the right is, uh, is a necklace I made for my mother when I was 10 years old. So here I am using limpets and weaving, you know, macrameing them together uh, in a very sort of accepted jewelry type situation. And so I've always been using my hands like forever with tying stuff up and knotting. And I helped my mom repair fishnets when I was a kid too. And so then this piece on the left is the first one I made with the hex marini. I'd done like some donut stuff previously, but it was a conceptual piece where it was called Girl Beard. And I felt uh, when I was in Alfred, I felt surrounded by a good old boy culture. No, you know, that's just the way it, it was at the time. And, um, and so I wanted this filter to help me to communicate with people because with uh, probably men in the community, because I often feel like I say the wrong thing or, um, you know, it's that I'm doing the wrong thing or something. So I always want that filter. There's no filter between my brain and my mouth, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I love of, how self-aware you are in that you, you can speak your truth, Kate. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's a lot of truth out there, but there's like a um, garter belt uh, attachments are holding that to some rubber. So it goes around your head, it's real cute. And it's like, I just wanna keep pushing things with my, with my process, I just want to keep pushing things. So I'm trying this new suite of work or series of work that has this sort of delineation by metal line. And it's been super fun. I can't make the same thing over and over. It just melts my brain with boredom. And, and my, I think it's like, is it my ADHD or my PTSD or my, what? I don't know. I need to have a number of projects to work on at the same time or else I, I, I lose it a little bit. So I always like pushing things forward and, and finding new ways to love glass. Like I just love glass so much. And, and I have to say like institutions like Wheaton and Pilchuck, they just make the people who have the passion, you and me, Jen, it's like the best thing for us in the world to be with our friends or with our peers and creating glasses teamwork for me and, and a lot of people who work in the Italian style, and that's what we know. So it's just, it's just such a fruitful, amazing place to be um, and an institution that supports you. And I'm just excited for the future of these institutions and opening up and being more accessible. I know we're all going through a hard time with COVID and uh, we have to support these places that feed artists' souls like Wheaton, um, it really just is, is really done some amazing things for me over time. So thank you institutions. Yay, and thank then, you. And then I'll pass it I off to you. I could say a couple of words to that same effect, Kate. Um, I just spent some time at Penland for six weeks. Um, I serve as a trustee at Pilchek Law School. Um, 
And I've been really meditating a lot on how important these places are for that direct contact with other artists from around the world. Pilchuck especially is an international glass school. Um, so you'll get that dinner time where you're sitting with people from multiple countries. And I feel like that's where real diplomacy and exchange happens. And it's such a beautiful thing. You can learn so much in such a short amount of time through interacting with other artists. And I just, um, I appreciate that space so much. So I'm very grateful for all the organizations that work so hard through this difficult time to give us that, those connections. I have a, a welding fabrication background as well as glass blowing. Um, I went to a trade school um, when I was a sophomore at Alfred to get some welding uh, fabrication experience. And um, back when I started working with Lino, he was excited about that and he'd give me little drawings and on uh, napkins and I'd fabricate these burner molds. And it gave me the idea that like, you can make custom work with custom tools. There's one of the pieces, the finished pieces that Lino made off of the burner molds. And uh, my time at Chihuly Inc as well, I worked as an independent contractor in their mock-up area that makes all the steel structures that hold the glass. And so that really inspired me on, um, on making unique, tools or unique processes um, to make unique work. And it's something I admire about Kate is that she's always driven to make work that is her own and not derivative. And um, I can't express how um, that's a hard path to take. You know, it's, it's really hard when you're in a place like the Pacific Northwest that is so full of incredible artists doing incredible work and techniques um, to be able to live around that and absorb all of that, but still come out making work that's uniquely yours is I think a great achievement. And so I'm inspired by people like Lino and Dale and Kate to, to make this unique work. Um, this is a new body of work that I've been um, working on called Visual Fun. And I largely work in opaque glass because I love glass's ability to represent color so boldly and so true um, that this is a big departure for me to work transparently, but yet I'm still bringing in some of those opaque colors, um, the polka dots as a construct to define the form um, and using glass for its transparency has been really fun for me. And um, I sort of developed this technique of creating those dots um, with just raw color bar. And um, our next shot is um, a series I call the Buchi Giri series, which means overwhelming win in Japanese. And it sort of represents a time where I had spent a period really trying to perfect the craft and make functional objects. And this was the first time I was allowing myself to go back sculpturally and investigate glass and its ability for scale, because I was noticing a lot of my work was all the same size. It was what I could lift back and forth to the glory hole. And I wanted to remove that constraint of scale and achieve um, larger scale by really having the annealing oven decide what the scale was gonna be, the scale constraint. And so I make all these pieces individually, almost like a Christmas ball and I bonk them off um, one by one, and I superheat them hot torching, which to me sort of reminds me of my welding process of wanting to superheat something and weld it together inside the annealer. So I'll get all dressed up in a hot suit and I'll hop in, the, in an annealer that's up at 1100 degrees. So it's a little bit hotter than normal annealing temperature and superheat the joint and connect the pieces. And so as you can see, we're able to achieve a bit of a larger scale um, I do have an idea going into the pieces of what I'm looking for, but there is a bit of spontaneity because I am hopping in the annealer and building these things in the annealer. And, um, you know, this work might look a little bit more common nowadays, but when I started making them um, in 2007, it was a really big leap of faith for me to like take a whole production day and put it into one piece in the annealing oven. It was a big risk for a young artist with limited resources, but, um, I'm really happy with the results and what I was able to achieve. Um, and my time working at Chihuly's and Mockup really helped inform me on a different way of building that um, I can build modularly. And I was inspired by color and, and textiles, um, hearkening back to what Kate was talking about too earlier. I'm very inspired by Kate, by um, textiles and 
instead of organizing these in a pattern, I really wanted them to be random. And I really thought closely of what colors were going next to each other. These are the right. same pieces. So it's multiple oh. panels. They could be shown in different, in different ways, but um, this is the way that I normally show it as a blanket. And um, this piece was recently sold a couple of years ago out of the Tacoma Art yes. Museum. Another great I'm, organization, Pacific Northwest. Thanks, Tacoma Art Museum. <laughs> I, I love this because on the surface, it reminds me of the Bujigiri, right? Mm, but then mm. but then when you see the side of it, you see that they're like, this is a mold, they're mold blown, right? With all the they're different colors. Blown. Yeah, so that they can all be the same and fit up modularly. So there is sort of a math going on. I really responded to what you were saying. I was terrible at math, but it seems to really come into my work a lot. Um, but I do yeah. want to work with it organically in a way. But this is a great example of using that technique or craft skills to be able to blow into a mold well enough to have it come out to be a conceptual artwork, you know? So I really feel like you and I both have work that shows that balance of the two. Whereas a lot of programs these days are sort of pushing people into concept and ideas more. I think there really can be a healthy, healthy balance. Do we have to choose, Kate? Do yeah. we have to choose between craft person and conceptual artist? I don't we know. <laughs> you know, I, I get I get upset when I apply for things and then I, I'm i like, oh, am I a craft artist or am I an artist? <laughs> I uh, Will I lose out on this because I checked the wrong <laughs> box? And but I, I, I see these, it all. <laughs> yeah, I see these pieces as being really organic and I, I respond to them so much, the your beautiful um, neon. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and you know, it's it's odd for me to do this process, to be honest, to be really a designer and sort of the back of the house person, um, but I'm really getting the results that I want. I've been working with not only my husband, Jeremy Burt, but Megan Stelgis, um, Kelsey Firmkopf, local neon um, vendors to help me realize this work. And um, it's really gratifying to spread out and embrace my community and embrace what my community has to offer to get a body of work that I feel so strongly about out there. But it's also super weird for me as somebody who's usually all hands on and does it myself. It's, it's a and, tough- But this does represent, uh, it is. <laughs> sorry. Letting, letting go just a little bit um, to get the results that I'm looking for. And I think there's a lot of great examples out there of how great that works. I mean, Dale, we both work with them is a great example yeah. of that, that you, you can achieve a lot more when, when you work with the community <laughs> to get it done. <laughs> Here's the girls when they were young. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Fred, here you go. Here's a beauty shot. <laughs> Sweetie and Scout as little babies. And I love this shot because it allows me to talk about the people who inspire me right here. We have Johanna and Dick Marquis. Um, I'm so grateful for the community of teachers that I've had in my life. And it's inspired me to be an educator beyond a studio artist, to be somebody who um, puts the information out there that I was so fortunate to get. Um, I spent 15 years working with Lino and had the opportunity to not only know Keiko, but consider him a great friend and mentor. And um, I just really appreciate that opportunity to have worked with um, such incredible people and artists. And he was the first Italian artist to come and teach glass blowing at Pilchek. Yeah, um, yeah, Ben Moore brought him over. And then he said, uh, I don't like this, but you should ask my brother. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But there's some great stories out there of um, Keiko working with the fellows that would come over to work at Panini. And I feel like we owe him a great debt of gratitude for um, sort of promoting the gaffer artist relationship and his willingness to work with the guest artists that would come to Vanini is very brave for me because I'm sure he got a lot of flack. It was a small company town. And um, beyond all that flack, he put himself out there and made himself available. And I think um, a lot of what we're doing here, that seed was planted there at Vanini. And it continues with the gaffer and artist and res residence relationship at Pilchek. And I think about Keiko a lot when I'm up there in that position. Sure. Um, here's some then, great shots of working yeah. with Dave Walters and Lino up at Pilchek. Um, I feel so grateful to have that relationship with Dave Walters to a great friend of ours. And um, I got to work with him at Sonia Bloomdahl's when I first came to town. I know you worked with Sonia as well, Kate. Um, oh, she was yes. somebody who's really supportive of young female artists and put her on the team and she was working regularly. And 
making some beautiful and camo work with a lot of color and you do such great color mixing and it, it makes me think of like um I learned a lot know. from her she was very influential to me as a female artist in the area I, I'm sure you also heard many of her stories and um you know it's just tough as a female artist I think if you're not connected to somebody else um, because the system is mostly guys helping guys and but um, she's a fantastic artist and I still love her very much of course. She did a lot of really interesting color combinations of mixing colors and I think that's something that you've taken on and really taken to a next level that's really interesting. Oh my god I love what those colors reactive so colors and reducing colors are going to do with each other. Oh um, yeah that was her that's her there was definitely some combos that were Sonia combos, but it's uh, important, like Jen said, it's important to gather the information from your teachers. Like Lino was my teacher in workshops and stuff and Sonia, but I never wanted to make what they make except to learn and then move past it. But you want to assimilate that information for sure. And, and then I keep going. And just one more word, like I think that those pictures really beautifully capture the nonverbal communication that goes on in the team. And that's something that I really love about working on teams in the Pacific Northwest is getting to a point where everybody understands your responsibilities, understands where they're to support each other and that we can get something accomplished with very different personalities really has always given me hope in the greater world, to be honest, that these smaller communities of people who can be very different people can work together and make something really beautiful. It's really gratifying. I spent some formative years working at um, Chihuly Inc. with Jim Mongrain, both at the Boathouse and at his Fourth Avenue studio. And here we are up at Mukilteo. I can't remember the artist we were making work for, but as you can see, it's quite large scale. We have the unit out um, <laughs> to achieve that. that. The captain. But I just the captain. I feel so grateful to be able to work with these professionals. And it's inspired me to lead my own teams. And I've had great opportunities at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. Um, I don't think I would have been able to experiment with the Bucciguri series and do that without that resource. A lot of the work for my early shows were made completely at the Museum of Glass. So I can't say enough how, how much support I've gotten from the Museum of Glass um, to make more experimental work. I really appreciate that opportunity. Plus you're always so tight with your friends. You guys would trade time so much to be able to make it the dream happen. So you didn't have to shell out money to your buddies. And Absolutely. You know, I think at one point I did take out a home equity line of credit, but a lot of work got me just out of trade. I'll help you if you help me <laughs> you kind of thing. And it's brought me all over the world. Um, here I am on the right in Australia at the Jam Factory teaching a workshop. And on the left is a workshop that I taught a few times with my friend, Nettie Blair in Australia called Eating Your Way Through Design where we'll um, create oh, a table setting that's, um, that's created and we'll make a menu all based on what's local and fresh. And we'll have a big feast at the end. On the right, we're um, on the road to the dump at Pilchek and we set up a big, large table and completely transform the space. And this is a great way to look at functional design as well as cook and have some fun. And another reason why I appreciate Pilchek and those, um, those summer craft schools so much for being able to make those connections. And those connections sort of inspired uh, my husband, Jeremy and I to make collaborative work that is experiential and um, that people can experience and become part of. And we've created this piece called Transient Light Graffiti. And at first it just started out as a simple alphabet on the wall plugged in. And then we put LEDs and batteries inside so that they can become mobile and create these huge word building sets that people can play with and spell their own words. And it's been really fun to see how our young community experiences it so uninhibited. Oh, you can see blanket in the background of this one. <laughs> exactly. that, that's from your show at the Museum of Glass, right? That's right. In Tacoma. Yeah, I believe it was in, in 2014 in Tacoma. And I think this is a shot of a recent show I curated at Traver um, and a beautiful Fred Cheetah piece in the foreground. Talk about light and motion. Um, it's a half sphere of, or a half circle of neon that slowly spins 
And this is a long exposure um, photograph of the piece so that you can capture it in its, in its realized form. And in the background, um, the concentric rings are a piece from my husband, Jeremy Burt, um, that Facebook has, now has in their collection. And on the left is a piece from Kelsey Firmkoff, a local master glass bender that we work with often. And here's another one of those light drawings from my most recent class. So I appreciate the opportunities that I get to interface with the community as an educator. And um, my relationship with Hilltop artists is um, one that I'm really happy and proud of. I was an early um, instructor there for their Remens Hall, um, juvenile hall um, program that they have. And it's realized like that you may not turn into a hugely proficient glass person, but sometimes these programs are life-changing for kids. And it's been really gratifying to take time and be part of those on occasion and see the difference that arts can make in somebody's life. Jen and I also uh, experienced a lot of the community here in the Pacific Northwest because Bubba Mavis was still a gallery oh, when we first came to <laughs> town. And um, it was just a really wonderful place to come with our community and celebrate weirdness. It was a gallery space that wasn't a formal gallery space. It was part of our friend's living quarters and and it right. was- Brian Pike would and have, Robbie Miller. Yeah, Brian Pike, Robbie Miller, they would have uh, Bubba and Mavis were the cats that, the Robbie's cats, right? So it was, it's a slice of Seattle history and to be involved with that was just, it was just very collaborative and wonderful um, and incredible, I think. You had two I shows, right? Shows I, had, I had the, I believe the show so, with yeah. Vanessa Wood and, and Sarah Chase. Yeah, so mm, that was beautiful pretty fantastic. Show. So, um, and I think when I think it was of, a little more relaxed, people could really put out there the stuff they really wanted to make that might not be more yeah, um, financially viable gallery. in a bigger gallery. Yeah, yeah not viable, not sellable. It was more experimental. We had somebody made bread sculptures, like oh. it was, you know, um, and um, Jeff Zimmerman used to show there. A lot of people, a lot of people showed there. That was great. When I think of community, I really think of how fortunate I was to find my family in glass. And when I, I kind of thought a little globally because I traveled a lot as a kid, but with glass, you like really think globally. And I was super fortunate to go to Japan in 92 for the opening of Toyama. So you can see there's Pino sitting in the front there. Um, and it just, I was exposed to so much that blew my mind with glass and then the other stuff that went around glass I liked. I studied theater before glass so I really liked working in ensemble but I didn't like being on stage so much. I liked being in the background doing stuff but um, this was a fantastic experience. Harumi Yukitake, we've got Kotaro's in there. A lot of Japanese artists are in here. Teresa's there. Also Michael Rogers is there and then the person who was the American teacher um, Jack Wax was also there. You can see him sort of at the top and I'm hiding sort of underneath them. I'm good at that kind of stuff. But um, the glass community has been so important to me. Um, Dave Walters, Jen Ellick, Karen Willenbrink, uh, Pat Davidson, you're in there, just not in the photo, but um, I just am really lucky to have a core group of friends that have, um, I mean, Dave and I were, we were in school together. We were partners, we were glass partners. And, and uh, having a connection with the people that you went to school with or that you started your adventure in glass with is very important. And it's just, it's just necessary for me as a serial um, single person. I really, really love my connection to people, my connection to institutions like Pilchuck and Penland and Wheaton, like the, the friends that I've made there, they're my friends forever, no matter what. Uh, wow. And so community really influenced what I did when I was at Wheaton uh, last November, this past November. So here you're seeing uh, um, rondelles that were made for me uh, by the staff there. Thank you so much for all your hard work. And then to the right, you see a piece by Dick Weiss I had the opportunity to do a collaboration with Dick 
where he's going to make some panels out of these um, rondelles. And that's just, it was great. I didn't really, COVID's made it hard to think. I didn't know what to focus on in the uh, residency that would be new and experimental. And this just fits the bill. So Dick Weiss used to be married to Sonia Blumdahl. So he and Sonia are like my mom and dad out here. So even though they're not together, they're still in my heart. Um, also, uh, just wanting to talk about this piece a little bit, Jen smiling, uh, because it's something that connects us. So uh, I, I think I hired Jen or Jen came and helped me. I don't think she'd let me pay her. She's like that a <laughs> lot. But um, I remember with Vanessa Wood and you and I working on this piece in a hot studio in the summertime and um, Pilchuck, I had an emerging artist in residency at Pilchuck and, and that's why I could make this house. You notice the other big house I made at Wheaton because there's no way I could ever try to do this and make money from it that I know of yet. If anybody lets me know, please inform me. But <laughs> I just love connecting things. So this is a house that's made to fit me inside it to simulate being underwater because I spent seven years out of the water at this point. And um, I just love industrial glass and I love working with other people to do stuff, but I did a lot of this by myself, that's for sure. And it's interesting how work that you have a personal relationship with when it goes out into the public I made this piece in 95 before the internet. And then as like Instagram came along, there's just such an interesting um, interaction with the public and my work that made me more aware of, of like how I want to get my work out more. I wanna create these childlike situations where other people can appreciate what I've made in a, in a way that affects their body and their, so I guess that's my luminous thing that connects me to Fred, maybe, Fred Cheetah. Um, I do like to work within the community. I'm realizing more that um, I want to connect people to the ocean and that adults don't matter as much as children. So um, with the public art piece that I did in 2018, I worked with the Hilltop artists. That was my first time working with them. And I really, really appreciate um, their help so much. And I, I want, uh, it's just, for me, it takes a village to do anything. So I'm just so grateful that people wanna go down the crazy road with me that I like to tread. So Andrea's in the back there. She's the lady with the little bun. And um, she it has been my assistant for 15 years, I think it is now. And I'm just so thankful for her involvement in my life. And um, Greg Owen is in this picture. We don't. We didn't always work together, but we are great friends. And I am also so thankful for his presence in my life and um, the ability that he had to share and shine, share other people's artwork and shine with them and magnify their voice. It was just, it's just been really wonderful for, for us as a community. Yeah, yes, we do, Susan, Gorgeous. we miss Greg. And Love then, um, so, so this is my first, permanent public piece, it's in Tacoma, and it wow. is, um, it's at a aquarium there. And I, I so I worked with, with the, at the Museum of Glass with the Hilltop artists to make the glass. And I really like the concept of having them help me make the parts and then having it be at this place uh, forever. So they can, when they bring their children there, when they go there, they can say, I helped make that. I have a connection to this. And um, when we worked together, I also brought a scientist, a biologist from the aquarium to them and talked to them about the science behind things. And it's, I just really um, love the scientific aspect of things. And it's just very exciting. Uh, I also um, just wanna speak about this piece that I did in collaboration with my friend, Lisa Liegren Alexanderson here in Seattle. Uh, it's a temporary public art piece, but it's called Oceans of Emotion. And in it, we bought 4,000 sequins and then distributed them out with our friends and had parties and invited people, brought them to parties and brought them to parks and to um, block parties and uh, to get the public's input on how COVID has affected us. And, what, and we wanted people to respond to the phrase, release 
and embrace. What do you want to release? And what do you want to embrace? And so then we hung them on this construction fence. They're still up for another month in, um, in Wallingford here in town. It's, it's not really that much to look at per se, but they move in the wind because they're attached by keychains. And it was just fascinating to solicit people's um, participation. Um, I'd ask people just to tell me things and I would draw or write them, or people would tell me over Instagram what to write and I would do that. And it was it's just an interesting thing to try to get the participation of not only your own community, but then to step it up and step it out a little bit is challenging. And I, I really would like to do that in the future. It's just, it's interesting. How do, how does our work develop? How does it change? Like that's, that's just a big question. I think I you've been able to do that so well, Kate, though. I really admire how you've been able to create a personal process that, and then it can in turn, you can include other people in other hands, but still get a great result that you're going for in the end. Like the jellyfish are a great example of that, that you had, you involved many hands in it. You then all of a sudden had an opportunity to educate and talk about, you know, your passions of sea life, but get all those young hands up at Hilltop to help you, but still get incredible results that look like a Kate Rhodes piece in the end. I have to compliment you on that to be able to create that process. It's really unique. I, I really don't. results out of it. I really <laughs> don't want to copy other people. I think it's rude. And, uh, but I understand not everybody's built that way. I've always had physical limitations, even when I started glass. So I, think as I get older, it's really important to um, let other people help me more <laughs> and to ins you inspire other people and get them to do the work for, for cheese on toast. You know, we got to figure that stuff out. Becoming a designer is not desirable for me, that I can't touch the glass and I can't move the glass. I look at the pieces I made when I was younger and I was more able and um, I'm so excited by that and I love it, but I have to, you know, taking care of ourselves is important as we get to be older artists. And so communicating your vision to other people and having them implement it, that's an art form too. It just, you know, have to ease into it, I guess. Um, it looks like Fred's asking us a great question. Uh, Photographs yeah, you, of your work are very important. Do you take your own? Oh, great question, Fred. Thanks um, so much, Fred. I would say um, great question. I get to work with um, artists like Russell Johnson and Ian Lewis, who I'm cur currently working with as well. But I really feel like things started to change for me once Russell started shooting my work. And I, I, I love the time with him. He's a wise man, a guru. And um, I get to talk to him about my work and life. And I feel like I really get to see my work for the first time out of the dirty studio when I'm at Russell's. So I, I just value the time with him so much. And I'm really enjoying the relationship I'm creating with another Alfred alumni, Ian Lewis, as he's shooting our neon work for us. Yeah, he's shooting some of my work now too. I, when I lived in the Bemis building downtown in our like uh, south of the dome, it's called Soto. But uh, it was great to come out of my studio with my piece, roll it on a table to her studio, to Rosari's studio and have her shoot it. But, um, you know, I've had a lot of photographers come and go in my life and I get them to shoot the important work for sure. But I also am obsessed with documenting everything myself as well. And I think that's a good thing because the way that we look at our work is the most important. And of course, Russell, he can make the pieces look incredibly um, stunning, I think, but are the way that we look at stuff, it's good for the future to have all those images. Um, it was interesting trying to do this talk because I ran into a wall, like with, I had to get out some photographs and take pictures of foot, like <laughs> it's, it's strange the change from the tangible prints to digital and stuff like that. But yeah, Fred, images are the most important. You can make a bad piece of work look good with a good photo, that's for sure. And that's how you represent yourself to the world, especially these days. 
It's a really important relationship. I'm really grateful to have. Any more questions out there? Uh, do you have advice for young artists who have perhaps just graduated from art school and are struggling to find footing in this era? Keep good connections with the people you left school with. Keep up conversations. One of the things that's saving me and has saved me in the last two years is my friendship with Jen, uh, Karen Willenbrink, and uh, Patricia Davidson. We Zoom. We used to Zoom every two weeks or every week. We just trying to keep ourselves uh, together, you know, and, and I'm just so fortunate to be part of this group of strong women that have so many strengths and have their strengths in different areas. We just tend to patch together. So you got to keep up with your friends from school and keep the passion alive because it's tough to stay positive these days. What, what do you think, Jen? Good answer. Um, I, I agree. I think um, strengthening community connections, um, getting yourself to a place where you want to be, like look at the artists you admire, look at the places that are making interesting work and get yourself there, do what it takes to get yourself there. Um, and those craft programs are so important to expanding that community to, from your local community to an international community. Um, places like Pilchek has really opened up the world to me in a way that I could have never have imagined. Um, so I'm really appreciative once again for those experiences that I get to have at Penland and Haystack. We haven't mentioned very much in, in Pilchek. Oh, Haystack. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and I also didn't really mention the Jam Factory, but I've had a lot of young people asking me, what do I do next? What do I do next? And um, I think Pittsburgh Glass Center also has been super supportive of me and my work. And they have a great program, an internship program. Um, I'd say Pittsburgh and the Jam Factory in Australia are two places that are sort of that next step to develop your work. They offer you um, support and room and board, but also um, can, like in the jam factory specifically, you'll be a team member making production work for the company, but also affording opportunities to develop your own design work. And they have an incredible gallery there um, to show your work as you're learning and being part of a team member. So I think there's places like that, there, especially Pittsburgh and, and the jam are two places that are so supportive for that next step for artists. Um, yeah, very grateful. Urban Glass too, another awesome, awesome program. Sorry, Urban, I should have mentioned you a lot sooner. Um, also has an internship tech program and a great gallery. And it's right by all these incredible museums, you know, and sure New York's really expensive to live in, but you can find a way. Um, so expand your community, support your local community, but always be expanding it. And, and be willing just to go for an experience. When you're younger, you can handle it. Living in a place with five people, et cetera. I, I know that's not how many people want to be in the long run, but I mean, that's what we did when we moved here. Multiple roommates, Sarah Chase. And, uh, and you know, you've got to just, just find your creative people and try to stay with them, you know, and, and especially with glass, because it's it takes a certain kind of breed of person to really love it and want to be part of it all the time. But becoming attached to a place, doing an internship at um, Corning or down in, in Virginia and stuff like that, it, 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 it's important to gain more experience out of school. School stuffed you full of school stuff. Now you have to go out there and let it percolate a little bit, let it come out of your pores clear out and get your own voice going. That's just takes time. So enjoy it, right? We have time for one more question. Um, Kate, how do you see your jewelry within your entire oeuvre? Do you continue to make it as you do your larger sculptures? I didn't talk about my jewelry just because it's, uh, other than to show you my inspiration. When I was saying before, when I'm working on a giant piece that takes 300 hours, I need to break it up by doing stuff that'll be finished in a short amount of time. Sea stones and jewelry, I can finish pretty quickly. And so that makes me happy. I love taking jewelry with me uh, and, and giving it to people and trading it and having it as like easy cash uh, 
to a certain extent. I studied jewelry design uh, in 80, 86 and also light metals when I was at RISD. Like I, I really love jewelry. There's something in me that has a, I am a, I love the shiny surface of gems and the depths of the stone and uh, Fred, you should tell this for me, like, you know, just loving the, the natural formation, the hexagonal formation of, of um, what is that, a rock crystal, things, things like that. So I just love adorning and beauty. And so jewelry just sort of dovetails into that, that I can make people happy and that a person who doesn't have a lot of money can get a peace of mind as, you know, as I started making more expensive, bigger pieces, I started making smaller, less expensive pieces as well, because it's nice to be able to reach everyone, I think. And I don't see jewelry as separate from art making at all. You can have it both, art and craft. <laughs> <laughs> can we tick both those boxes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you should be. Every time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both for this entire evening, and it has just been wonderful. If ever, keep in touch with Kate and Jen um, through their Instagram, through their websites. Um, check that out, and keep your eyes on the e email because we will be sending out a video, um, and it will be posted to both our website um, through uh, to YouTube and on our website. Um, so any, any last words before I close it up? We're just um, so thankful for you tuning in tonight and participating in our talk. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, I see family and friends, Marianne, my aunt's on there, Dorothy Sachs, you know, um, also we've got Chris Rifkin, lots of uh, names that we recognize, people we went to school with and we work with. Karen Willenbrink, you're here too. Kimberly Keith, you know, I just think the future is really exciting and glass. We can't do things like we normally do right now, but that just makes us have to think better and have to be more fluid and be able to adjust to change. And that's a healthy thing for humans. So um, thank you from, so much for coming. Jen, you want to? I'm going to echo you, Kate, just uh, being really grateful to everyone who came and participated and who are always so supportive. I know you. You're always at all the shows. I see you and I appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you, Wheaton, for having me. And thank you, Kate. Yeah, thank you, Wheaton, for making this all possible. And I can't tell you how much my last residency has re-energized me and reintroduce glass to me. I've been missing it so much. I'm so, so thankful. Well, and again, thank you both. Um, I'm going to remind everyone again uh, in the chat, I placed the link to the next Wheaton conversation. And I know we'll have just as much fun as we did um, putting this one together. And um, so check out that link. And again, thank you from both Pamela and I for everyone being here. And thank you, Kate and Jen. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night, everybody. Good night.